Hi, my name is Joe Clappis. I'm the lead instructor for the Beaverworks Summer Institute Quantum Software Development course. We are very excited for the students to share what they've learned during the program here. Now, quantum computing is a very challenging and esoteric topic, even for seasoned engineers. So it's especially impressive that our high school cohort was able to go from zero experience with quantum programming to understanding, implementing, simulating, and analyzing real quantum algorithms. This technology is set to disrupt the computing industry, and we've seen a clear need for a strong quantum capable workforce to embrace the opportunities that it will bring. And as we've seen here, programs like this will help create such a workforce. After learning the fundamentals and practicing coding in quantum computing frameworks, the students were tasked with researching a quantum algorithm in the literature to implement in software. Once they verified the correctness of their program through simulation, they used resource estimation tools to determine the efficiency of their implementation. This is something that professional quantum software engineers do to analyze the practicality of certain quantum algorithms and ultimately understand how quantum computers can be used to solve problems in the real world. Today, the students will explain the algorithm they chose and report the results of their work. All right, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for attending. All the groups have prepared uh, videos around five minutes. So we're just gonna share the video. Please, uh, if you have questions, type them in the, um, in the chat and after the end of each video, we'll have one or two minutes uh, to answer those questions. Hello everyone. Today we will present our algorithm and research in quantum computing. My name is Sarthak and my teammates are Shahul and Jeffrey of Team Schrodinger's Beavers. Today, we are going to talk about the quantum counting algorithm. The purpose of this algorithm is to find the number of solutions to a given function. For example, Consider an arbitrary equation with multiple solutions. The quantum counting, or QC algorithm, helps us find the number of solutions to this equation, which should then help optimize the search for individual solutions. First, we need to define the problem explicitly. The oracle is a function that tells us if an input is correct or not. This is the specific function we're trying to find the number of solutions to. The classical approach to this problem would be to run the oracle for every input and record the inputs that the oracle says are correct. The quantum approach is to run the oracle for every input at once using a quantum superposition, and then selectively count the number of correct solutions. In order to do this, we can use quantum amplitude estimation, or QAE. It amplifies the correct states and then uses them to tell us the probability of an input being correct. The combined solution is to use QAE to get the probability of a correct input and multiply the total number of possible inputs. This will give us an estimate for the correct number of solutions. Now that we know the algorithm, why is it significant? QC is quadratically faster than the classical approach and is used as a subroutine for many other quantum algorithms. Some uses for QC are for Grover's search algorithm, which needs the number of correct inputs to find the values of the solutions. We can also check if a solution exists or not. Finally, this can be used to determine the existence of a Hamiltonian cycle. We implemented the algorithm in Q-sharp and imported it over to Qiskit to analyze the algorithm. Here are the results of our resource estimation and practicality assessment. In general, the number of required qubits is the total number of counting qubits plus the total number of measuring qubits. The oracle that we tested on had a total of five solutions. In general, the more counting qubits seen, the more accurate our estimation will be. This is reflected in the errorless AER backend, where with one counting qubit, it produced the wrong solution, but the accuracy increased with more counting qubits. However, for any practical problem, the number of qubits will always be quite large, which causes an exponential increase in runtime. Due to memory issues in current hardware, QC is impractical today. Further, and the two other simulators, due to the large amount of noise and error on real quantum computers, there was low accuracy. However, there was still a chance that the algorithm would reach the correct solution. We created an implementation of QC that lets us find the number of correct solutions to a problem. The biggest takeaway is that the quantum counting algorithm provides many useful applications 
as a building block algorithm thanks to its quadratic speedup. We also worked on the quantum K nearest neighbors algorithm. This algorithm is used to classify images in the groups, such as the classifying airplanes or beavers. The K nearest neighbors is a classical machine learning algorithm that converts images into features, which are smaller processed representations of the image. Here you can see the feature representation of the grayscale beaver at the left. The training images are the ones that we already know the class of. The test images are the ones that we want to classify. For k equals 3, the image classifier would identify this test image as a beaver. We can compare the test image to all the training images at the same time by, again, using quantum superposition. Using a research paper as a guide, we created some of the required subroutines and code for the QKNN. Here are some of the subroutines required for this algorithm. We implemented three of the five listed subroutines. The final two subroutines lacked adequate description and one required the use of quantum RAM, a theoretical piece of hardware which doesn't exist. We were able to extract features, step one, put those features in the quantum state, step two, and prepare those images for processing, step three. To understand the paper, we broke it down into multiple sections and made organized notes on what we did and didn't understand. Some challenges that we faced were that there were very few circuit diagrams and some steps were omitted. One section even required using quantum RAM. Unit testing was also hard due to entangling because we could not selectively dump the value of certain registers halfway through the program. The paper puts forth an implementation with a certain complexity, but in reality, there's too much error in the subroutines that we were implement for it to be practical. In conclusion, we see that quantum systems provide a significant speed up in both quantum counting and quantum K and N compared to classical systems. It is exciting to see the endless possibilities that quantum computing can bring to us in the future. Thank you for listening to our presentation. All right, thanks so much. Schrodinger's beavers, we do, did have a question come in. So for the quantum counting algorithm, isn't it faster to classically find solutions since you are getting the values of solution and the number of solutions at the same time? Well, actually there's an algorithm called Grover's algorithm that can find the values of the solutions quadratically faster than the brute force method. So if you use that in combination with quantum counting, two quadratically faster algorithms together are still quadratically faster than just the brute force, brute force method of finding all the solutions. Awesome, thanks. All right, the, any, any more questions for Schrodinger's Beavers? Otherwise, we're gonna move on to Blockbusters. Let me share my screen again. All right. Hello. Today, we're going to be talking about the Novel Enhanced Quantum Representation for Digital Images, or NEQR. Our team consisted of me, Kyle Johnson, Denise Gonzalez, Jocelyn Lee, and David Parker. Now, you may be wondering, why would I want to use a quantum computer to represent digital images? And to answer that question, we need to look at the larger picture. A very important branch of information science is digital image processing. This is when an algorithm is used to process images, for example, satellite data or x-rays. These algorithms can be used for many things such as pattern recognition or edge finding. As our image and sensor technology has evolved, we now need to process more and larger images. This can begin to cause time problems for classical computers. One possible solution to this is quantum image processing. Now, in order to process images using quantum computers, the images need to be in a quantum state. This is what NEQR is used for. It transforms an image like this simple two by two, for example, into a quantum state where it can be stored and utilized by other quantum algorithms. All right, that's cool, but how do we get there? So in this four by, uh, the two by two image, we have each pixel that can be represented with a color and a location. The color is a simple eight bit binary string and the location uh, in this case is two qubits for the row and the column. So we need this, this uh, coordinate because when we're measuring a register of qubits, we're measuring one of four possible states. So we need to know which state we're in or which pixel we're looking at when we measure it. 
And this index qubit array allows us to do that. And we can do this with images of a larger size as well. So four by four and eight by eight. And we can do that uh, when we need Q, which is the grayscale range, the grayscale number of qubits plus two in, where n is the size two to the n size image. And in this case, we need 10 because eight plus two to the one is 10. And if we measure this, well, we expect these four results and that's what we get, uh, each with about a 25% chance as we expect. But this is in a noiseless simulation. So let's see it, how it would actually look on a real quantum computer with all the beautiful noise. And it's it's a lot. It's, it's a lot of error here and here. All these values are values we don't want. But we can see that the values we do expect are still pretty common. They're way more common than the, than the error. And this is just a limitation of quantum hardware right now. And the bigger the image, the worse this will get, which is why this isn't necessarily completely practical. Here's a practicality test for our algorithm. We tested up to a 16 by 16 2D array, which represents an image. We tested using Qiskit and a fake Montreal machine, which simulates a real quantum computer. As you can see, the circuit creation time is quite short, whereas the compile time is really long and increases exponentially as seen in the graph. The width or the amount of qubits needed to run the algorithm does not increase exponentially. However, it is quite a lot of qubits especially since the maximum amount of qubits a quantum machine can process is 65 qubits. The depth or the amount of quantum gates needed to run our algorithm also increases exponentially. Because the depth and compiling time increase exponentially, this poses a huge problem. If we wanted to process an image with hundreds of pixels, it would take way too many qubits and way too much time. As such, for any QR to be practical, we need hardware with lower error rates more qubits, and theoretical pieces of hardware such as quantum RAM to speed up compile time. If we can make any QR practical, we can use it in things such as quantum edge detection of medical images. We face some challenges throughout our project, starting with our initial research. With reading papers, we encounter lots of long and confusing equations. These equations also contain some symbols that we had never seen before. Luckily, the papers did provide a few explanations for us to understand the equation better. We also did some separate research um, to find additional information, and we found the Qiskit textbook to be really helpful in explaining the algorithm in simpler terms. Another challenge was that most of our literature we went through explained the algorithm implementation in 2x2 two two pixel images, which are way too small. We needed to code an algorithm that would work on any image size, which was a really hard challenge, We did end up, which, but we did end up figuring it out. Aside from the aforementioned challenges, we also encountered issues with our coding. The grayscale values for each pixel are supposed to be converted to binary, and these values can be read from left to right or vice versa. For some of the portions of our code, these binary numbers were required to be in Big Indian. When we were running our code and debugging, we noticed our tests were failing and didn't know exactly why, so we made sure our thought process was correct. At the end, we realized that our values were just being flipped into them being in Little Indian instead of Big Indian. Despite this being a small issue, it did take us a long time to figure it out. And here are our references and sources. Thank you for listening. All right, any questions for the Blockbusters? So, I didn't see any come in, but one question I, I might have is, how is your perspective of quantum computing and what quantum computing is changed from when you came into the program to now? Who wants to take that one? Uh, I can answer that one. Yeah, so when I originally came to this program, quantum computing seemed like this like end all be all. It would break everything. Just there were not a lot of people that know how to do it. But now after reading through all these papers and seeing it, a lot of these papers, they have these great algorithms, they're going through it, explaining everything. And then it, and then a, there's like these little tiny lines that say, oh yeah, but you need this theoretical piece of hardware, like quantum RAM to get this to work. And we don't have that. So we're, we're pretty far out from like, or from like actually using these in practice. And I just, I never realized that so many of these rely on like theoretical pieces of hardware that have never existed. Awesome. That's a, that's a great answer. All right, any other questions for the Blockbusters? All right, the next group is 
the fine men. Hello, my name is Alexander Sansevieri. Hi, my name is Tarun Mohan. Hi, my name is Marvin. And my name's George. We are the fine men and we are presenting quantum amplitude estimation. Let's get right to it. Quantum computers have some special properties that give them an advantage and sometimes even complete supremacy over classical computers. Superposition is one of these properties. Although measuring or observing a quantum bit or qubit will always result in a one or zero just like classical bits, before being measured a qubit can be in superposition. This means that it can represent a mix of both one and zero at the same time by having different probabilities of being measured as either one or zero something that classical bits can't do. This allows for three or four qubits to store eight or 16 possible states respectively, all at the same time, while classical computers can only store one state at a time. Interference is another property of quantum computers where qubits can interact constructively or destructively with each other, similar to waves so that we can manipulate the probabilities of measuring certain states. By using these advantages of quantum computers, we were able to work on the implementation of a quantum algorithm that is superior to classical algorithms. So the algorithm that we worked on implementing for the past two weeks is called quantum amplitude estimation. To explain the concept of this algorithm clearly, imagine you have a lock and a box of keys, some of which open the lock. Quantum amplitude estimation tells us how likely we are to pick a good key out of the box. Since qubits can represent multiple states simultaneously, it's as if all the keys from the box are put into the lock at the same time. Classical computers must sample every key one at a time. Amplitude estimation isn't only limited to figuring out the probability of picking a key. It has many other applications such as finance, machine learning, and Monte Carlo integration. In terms of finance, imagine that the keys from before were replaced with future spot prices or market prices of assets. And instead of a lock, we have the profit based on the future spot prices. Suddenly, the value of A mentioned before informs us how much money we're expected to make. Additionally, amplitude estimation significantly speeds up Monte Carlo integration, an estimation method useful for option pricing. Amplitude estimation helps evaluate risk measures too. It also makes several machine learning methods quicker, such as the nearest neighbor method. The notable development of quantum amplitude estimation applications is quickly optimizing many classical computer operations. Amplitude estimation has many interesting applications, but for our testing, we will be calculating this integral to this bound. Basically, when you do the math out, this is the answer that you want. But that's calculus, and calculus is hard. Instead, think of it like this. We want to calculate the area under this curve so we can add up a bunch of small rectangles under the curve to approximate the area. That's called a Riemann sum. The longer our quantum circuit is, the more rectangles we add and the more precise our estimation becomes. But longer circuits also have more air. If our circuits are too long, our output will be meaningless. To account for this, we tested several different sets of circuits with different lengths. Since current quantum computers deal with a variety of issues, the more gates and qubits you use, the more error prone it is. To see how practical our algorithm is, we found the circuit's width, depth, time to compile, and total number of gates needed. Width is the number of qubits used, and depth is the number of gates used. From this analysis, we can see that Lima takes longer to compile, since it has to convert the circuit into something the quantum machine can understand. This process causes more gates to be added, making it more error prone. An interesting thing we found was that the exponential implementation has less gates, which implies that there should be less error in our results. After running our algorithm on both the AER and the Lima, we created these graphs. Here you can see that for the linear implementation, the AER is accurate over 90% of the time, even as we scale up, but the Lima simulator gets worse as the number of iterations increases. We see the opposite trend for the exponential implementation. The Lima actually performs better or on par in terms of accuracy with the AER. However, we see that as the number of Q operators are increased, the percent error increases dramatically for both simulators. One of the main hurdles we had to face was understanding math-heavy papers about our algorithm. There were little to no circuit diagrams to look at, so we had to go off of the complex math, which we really haven't had much experience with before. In conclusion, 
we find that the most practical implementation of this algorithm as of right now is the exponential algorithm with a single iteration as it has a high accuracy and low number of total gates used. However, since we used a classical computer to simulate these results, we were limited in how far we could scale the algorithm up. This means that there could be a linear or exponential implementation with better accuracy, but it just can't be simulated classically. As quantum hardware becomes more and more advanced, we hope that we will be able to see how the accuracy of the algorithm changes with more operations and becomes more practical for real world use. Thank you. All right, any questions for the fine men? Give it a second. So one question, I mean, you touched on some of the challenges, but I was wondering if you could elaborate on what is, you know, let's say one of the challenges that you ran into that was really tough and sticky um, and how did you overcome it? Um, one of the main challenges was figuring out the post-processing of the algorithm. So we had the quantum part down and um, it seemed like it was all set, but then we had to figure out how to do the processing after that with all the classical operations. And we had a lot of trouble figuring out what exactly we had to do. So I'd say that was probably one of the hardest parts. Yeah. Yeah, for the audience, uh, a lot of today's quantum algorithms are actually hybrid. So you might have a part of the algorithm that is computed on a quantum computer, but then there might be pre and post processing in the classical. So um, yeah, that can be tough to kind of put, bring, put the data in and get it out um, and process it in a way that, that can be useful. Okay, any other questions for the fine men before we go to the next team? Okay, so the next team is Cassius. Alina and Katie. And we are Aaron, Alina, and Katie, and we are students at the Beaverworks Summer Institute in the quantum software course. Quantum software involves a computing method that increases efficiency and gives us the possibility to solve problems that are not possible classically. Classical computers use bits, which can be zero or one, to encode information. Quantum computers, on the other hand, use qubits. Qubits can be zero or one as well, but they could also be both at the same time. This means that they have some degree of zeroness and oneness. For our project, we studied the quantum phase estimation algorithm, or QPE. QPE is an important building block in many more complex algorithms. By itself, QPE can be used to solve for a value, the eigenvalue, in this equation. The left side of the equation consists of a rotation or a matrix applied to a register or an eigenvector. The right side consists of the eigenvalue multiplied by the register. Given a unitary operation affecting the phase of a register, we can compute the eigenvalue. The graph pictured here shows how a matrix or linear transformation is applied to the eigenvectors. The eigenvalue is the scalar by which the eigenvector is stretched. We can start by using a register of qubits and an ANSOA qubit. The more qubits there are in the register, the more accurate the estimation will be. The register is put into superposition and the ANSOA is put into the one state. Then the oracle is applied several times on the ANSOA qubit with the register as a control. After an inverse quantum Fourier transform, the register is measured and an integer is calculated from the bit string. The final value is calculated to be the integer answer divided by two to the power of the size of the register. Let's run through an example of QPE. We have a register with three qubits and one ANSOA qubit. We'll prepare all the qubits, apply the control to T-gate, a rotation, and then apply the inverse quantum Fourier transform to the register. After measuring, we find that the expected binary of the register is 001, which translates to one in decimal. The final answer is 1 divided by 2 to the power of the register size, 3. 0 0.125 is the same answer no matter the register size, meaning that the expected binary will change. First, we implemented the Kalinin unit test in QSharp, a language used to simulate qubits for quantum development. 
we have seven unit tests that utilize different gates, including the T gate, the R1, or P gate, and the S gate, all which are rotation gates, meaning they will change the state of the qubit. Additionally, we look at algorithms that use multiple insula or target qubits. We wrote tests for those in Q-sharp as well. All those tests ran successfully with the simulator. We then re-implemented the algorithm in Qiskit, a Python library for quantum software so that way we could test our QPE implementation on real quantum machines. These machines only use a handful of rotation gates, so they may have to apply several gates to achieve the effect of one gate on the simulator. At the bottom of the slide are all the rotation gates that Santiago used for our algorithm, which is more complicated than the original circuit diagram for QPE. The histogram show the frequency of each integer result, and unfortunately, the noise in real quantum computers do not allow for precise measurement with our implementation of this algorithm. At the top of the graph, we have the AER simulation, which represents an errorless system. It was able to identify the correct eigenvalue most of the time. We ran the same exact algorithm and test cases on two of IBM's quantum computers that we have access to, Manila and Bogota, and they both performed horrendously. This is likely due to quantum noise present in actual quantum computers. In the real world, it's actually really difficult to get qubits to interact in the way we want them to, especially as the length of the program increases. So we decided to simulate QPE on a more stable machine, IBM's Montreal, and that performed considerably better with almost half of the trials passing. So this brings us to practicality. QPE is not practical for smaller quantum systems, but it is for larger, less error-prone ones. In short, more qubits and a higher quantum volume produces more accurate results. The quantum computers that we have access to only have five qubits, which leaves us with four bits or binary digits of precision. That's not very many bits. So the first challenge we had was with understanding the papers. Because QPE is fairly abstract, there's a ton of math involved. Initially, our group had issues following the intuition and proofs due to our lack of knowledge in linear algebra. We spent the first couple of days stumped on eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and other concepts, but thanks to our instructors and TAs, we were able to sort that out. The second challenge we had was with this concept called endianness. If you are unfamiliar with it, it's basically just how computers read bit strings. To the right is a bit string 1011, which when converted from binary is 11. However, there's another notation that reads bit strings backwards. Instead of 1011, it reads 1101, which converts to 13. Qiskit, the Python library we use, assumes inputs are backwards, or little endian but the papers we read used a mix of big and little endian, which led us to interpreting incorrect results. Quantum phase estimation, which solves for the eigenvalue when given a matrix or rotation and an eigenvector, is one of the most important subroutines in quantum algorithms. The classical algorithm for finding the eigenvalue runs with on squared rotations, but the quantum solution has on log 2n rotations, making it much more efficient. The creation of this building block allowed for many more quantum algorithms to be feasible. Thank you. All right, thanks so much. We have a couple questions that came in. Um, so one question, this person asked, one thing I often do with coding is looking up documentation to get a better understanding of the code I use. Since quantum software is a lot newer, how hard is it to find documentation and how did you go around this issue in your project? Um, I can answer this question. So it is pretty hard to find documentation actually. I think one of the biggest resources we used was the Qiskit textbook. And that's very math heavy, but there were also a few circuit diagrams which were really helpful for us. We also looked at the Q Sharp documentation, which was super helpful if we wanted to use any methods. Awesome. Yeah, and one thing too, it's not just the code, right? I mean, a lot of these papers have this complex math and you try to, need to try to figure out what it's saying. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think anybody in our team really knew what an eigenvalue or eigenvector was before this this program. So how did you like figure that out? How did you um, you know try to understand what these papers were saying? 
we took a lot of, uh, we took a look at, at a ton of videos about linear algebra and tried to understand those. And I think the biggest thing was getting help from our instructors and having them show us examples and specifically how the math relates to our algorithm. Awesome, thank you, thank you. All right, I, I see there's another question, but I think we're gonna move on because it's a more generic question. We can get back to it in a second. Um, so the next group is going to be quirks. Um, so let me share my screen again. Okay. Our project is on long-term reclassification with quantum image processing by quirks. Our project is a long-term reclassifier that uses a quantum CNN for the pre-processing of long-term data. This helps speed up the detection of lung tumors. While this is what we landed on, there were many steps that led us to this idea. We started with a simpler algorithm, quantum phase estimation, and once we finished that implementation, we thought about what we could do with that and got to image classification. From there, we wanted to focus in on a specific real-world problem, leading us to a lung tumor classifier. Our data was in the form of mass lung scan images. This is useful because it aids in identifying the tumor in each image. As far as how our data was used in our project, the lung scans are classified into three main categories. Normal, meaning that the patient is healthy and doesn't have a tumor. Benign, meaning that, there's, that there is a tumor, but it doesn't need to be operated on. And malignant, meaning that the tumor is cancerous. So there are like multiple advantages to using a con convolutional uh, layer instead of a convolutional layer, uh, one of which is the implementation of the algorithm. Um, it actually doesn't have any QRM requirements. And just for some background, QRM is basically a piece of hardware that speeds up the process of bringing classical data into a format that quantum computers can deal with. Um, but the drawback is that it doesn't really exist yet. So it's a huge plus that this doesn't have any uh, requirements for that. In addition, some other advantages of this approach include uh, speed ups in multiple parts and a very, very high tolerance for errors. So for obvious reasons, these uh, could make our algorithm extremely game changing in the field that we're applying it to. Um, and now for a brief intro on neural networks. Neural networks take an input to run them through collections of neurons and weights within layers to eventually reach an output layer. The network trains by taking and training, training data with labels attached and altering the weights between each neuron to improve the accuracy of the model and minimize any potential loss. In our case, um, the input data contains images of lung scans and our output data shows whether or not the patient has a tumor. Zero means no tumor, one means benign, and two means malignant. For this, we use a convolutional neural network to sort the images. Convolutional neural networks are made up of convolutional layers, which extract information by, from, with an input, from an input by sliding a window known as a kernel across a set of data. CNNs usually have multiple convolutional layers, which can distinguish more complex features in an image, such as its contour and shape at the bottom right of the slide, you can see an example of a kernel that is used to sharpen an image. So now we're going to talk about our algorithm. In the last slide, we talked about kernels. So when we trained our model, we didn't use a classical kernel. We made a quantum kernel. The diagram at the top shows what a classical convolution would look like, while the diagram at the bottom shows what a quantum convolution would look like. This is a more in-depth version of the diagram on the bottom of the previous slide. It includes our oracle, which is basically the circuit that we made. We implemented in Qiskit our own version of what we call a quantum-evolutional neural network. In our implementation, we used the basic structure of a Penny Lane demos code, Penny Lane being a Python library that could be used for quantum, combined with a circuit derived from an arcs of article to implement something similar to a two by two kernel that would use qubits to reduce the number of parameters that we needed to input to the neural network. The algorithm starts off by using rotational Y gates to encode integer values from an array as qubits. Once it's done, we use a series of Hadamard, CNOX, Z, and X gates shown in the slide to put the qubits in a certain zero position. At the end, we used a quadruple controlled knot on the output qubit. This either changes the output qubit to a one or leaves it as a zero, depending on the state of the qubits in the register. Like a regular kernel, like a regular kernel, R is iterated over every two by two subset of numbers in the array. And each time we get the output qubit, we put it back in a new array that we input to our neural network for predictions. So this is our practicality assessment. We used 
four different backends, the Air Simulator, the Fake Manhattan, the Fake Montreal, and the IBM Manila. The first three are simulators, while the last one is a real quantum computer. The table shows the width, the, numbers, the number of qubits required, the depth, the longest path in the circuit, the compiled time, and the runtime of each of these machines with a 2 by 2 kernel. However, if we were to use an n by n kernel, the width would be n squared plus 1, and the maximum depth would be 2n squared plus the number of controlled gates on that qubit. Now we're going to talk about the positives and challenges that we had in working on this project. So some of the positives that we had about working on this project were that we got to study an advancing field in depth. Uh, we were able to learn lots of things from that and uh, we were also we also had a lot of opportunities to make mistakes and learn from them. And so some of the challenges that we encountered were that it was a hard uh, kind of hard to in, uh, understand the math in some of the papers. Um, sometimes it was harder to debug our code and we switched uh, throughout like IDs and data sets quite a lot. So that also made a challenge. So here's some references. Um, so we, we got our data set from Kaggle. Um, we have the penning lane demo, which uh, where we got uh, the backbone of our code from and the backbone of our circuit deck, um, circuit came from this arcs of article. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Lincoln Laboratory and MITRE for making this course possible. And we'd also like to thank our instructors, Richard and Joe, and our TAs for making this such a great course. And thank you guys for listening. If you have any questions. Okay, any questions for Quirks? Wait a second. So, so one thing, um, again, for the audience, this was a quantum software course. So we learned a lot about uh, quantum and quantum computing, but it was also about software. So one question I have for, for you all is, um, are there any you know, skills or things you learned about software development uh, as we went through this you know, quantum software development course? wants to take that one. Lessons learned about software, software development. Um, I can take that one. So um, one thing I was particular was usually when I, write, when I write my code, um, I'm a really messy person when, I write, when it comes to writing code. Um, I learned that that was a really bad thing to do. Um, I learned that it was easier from, I guess it was from you, Richard. Um, it was easier to start like small and then go big rather than start big and then figure out everything is wrong and then we try it again. Uh, yeah. Awesome. All right, cool. So let's move on to, thank you. So let's move on to the next group. Let me share. This is AIA. Hi, we're AIA, and today we're going to give you a glimpse of the world of quantum computing by looking at a fascinating quantum algorithm that relates to quantum image processing. But first, let's take a look at what quantum computing actually is. Quantum computing marks a new paradigm of computer science but made possible by the principles of quantum physics. While classical computing uses binary bits that have single state capabilities inherently restricting computing power, quantum computing uses qubits or quantum bits. These are unique because they can exist in multiple states at the same time, while bits can only exist in one state exclusively. For example, a qubit can exist in both the zero and the one state simultaneously, and that's called a superposition. This multi-state capability allows certain algorithms to be exponentially enhanced. Quantum computing also uses a concept called measurement, which causes a qubit in superposition to break down into a classical bit, valued at either zero or one. To further understand quantum computing, we should look at the property of quantum entanglement. This is when two qubits become intertwined into one composite qubit, and it's no longer possible to refer to each qubit independently. That's just a brief introduction to the rapidly developing world of quantum computing, but now let's take a look at quantum image processing. 
A quantum image is a method of storing image information, namely the position and color value of pixels, in a quantum system. With the use of qubits, images can be stored with significantly less units of information than classical bits. Quantum image processing just refers to working with images in this format. In order to create quantum images, we have to format them from classical images. Any QR, or Novel Enhanced Quantum Representation, is one such format that first appeared in a paper written by Chinese researchers in 2013. As opposed to classical representations of image data, which for a grayscale image would need 8 bits for each pixel to represent their respective values, the AnyQR representation of the grayscale image requires 8 qubits total to represent gray value for the entire image, and 2 groups of position qubits, which each are sized exponentially lower than the dimensions of the image. Specifically, ceiling of log base 2 of each dimension. The algorithm accomplishes its encoding by using a superposition so that every pair of groups of position qubits can be entangled with its appropriate color value qubits. This entanglement means if you measure a certain position, then you will measure the correct gray value for that position. Let's take a look at some examples. Here we have a 2x2 two two grayscale image, which we encoded in any QR, and we measured it and put the results in the histogram on the right. To read the labels, the format is as X position, then Y position, then color value. For example, at position 0, 01, the gray value is 140, and as you can see, all of these match the image correctly. Here is a 4x4 four four image, and also a 4x5 image which we encoded. One of the original restrictions in the paper we read was that the image had to be 2 to the n by 2 to the n. However, we avoided this restriction by just pretending that the image was 4x8, and then discarding any measurements that are out of bounds of the image. For example, at 3.7, we measure color 0, but since 3.7 is not actually part of the image, we can just throw that away. So we picked the AnyQR algorithm because of the great potential uses for it. As mentioned before, a direct use of AnyQR is to compress classical image data. But once an image is stored as a quantum image, you can take advantage of quantum image processing to edit the image significantly faster than through classical means. For example, although there's some limitations to this, if you want to change the colors of an entire image, it only requires manipulating eight qubits, while it would take much more and use classical methods. During our research, we also learned about some other algorithms that can be applied to any QR images, uh, such as edge detection, secure image transfer, and steganography, which is the process of hiding information in images. So this table shows our resource estimations for our four test images, which were all quite small in terms of pixels. But basically what this information tells us is that we currently don't have hardware that supports enough qubits and is robust enough against errors to use any QR practically, even though we can use it for some small contrived images. An interesting thing to point out in this data table is the, uh, the 10 second compile time for a simulation of a real quantum computer is much longer than that of a classical computer. So while quantum image processing is much faster than this classical equivalent, um, the process of actually encoding quantum images is still an unsolved problem. Here are some of our key takeaways from this process. We learned that reading quantum computing papers can be incredibly trying, but external resources such as Kiskit Notebook can provide immense guidance on understanding them. We also learned that there is tremendous benefit in unit testing. Unit tests allowed us to visualize and verify our results. But most importantly, we learned the benefit of writing readable code instead of just rushing through it, especially after we spent an entire day debugging just to find that we accidentally used a Y instead of an X in one of our measurement result functions. Thank you guys so much. And we wanted to give a special thanks to the Beaverworks program, our teachers, and our TAs for such an incredible opportunity to learn more about quantum software. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, AIA. So um, we have some, some questions coming in. If I didn't get to your question, um, we may have some time at the end uh, to go back. But um, one question that, that has a lot of upvotes that might 
tweak slightly is um, how do you know that the algorithm actually works if you haven't run it on a strong quantum computer yet? So for example, let's say five, 10 years down the road, we have much better quantum hardware. You can use more qubits, you can have more complex circuits. How can you be confident that your implementation of this algorithm um, is going to work on those machines? And how do you know it's gonna give you the right answer? Okay, I can take this. Um, so we actually are able to run this on some smaller images uh, because we have simulators that are, that can currently like, they can like support, simulate more qubits than we have access to in the public right now. So simulators are useful and also just like going through the logic of the papers is helpful too to see how they work. So, um, here's, here's another question. So what are some of the criteria to determine if an idea is better suited to quantum algorithms as opposed to traditional algorithms? So in other words, you're trying to solve a problem. Um, how do you know if it's going to be better to use a quantum algorithm versus a classical algorithm? How do you see the difference? I would think that this is primarily case by case, like, um, and sometimes you will have like some, you'll develop like a classical algorithm for many problems before you uh, attempt to solve it quantum. So like, I don't really feel like you are making a choice there in the first place. Okay, cool. All right, any other questions for AI? All right, the next team is um, Russian Bananas. So thank you, AIA. Let's move on to the next video. Uh, okay. Hello, I'm Ethan. I'm Maxwell. And I'm Stephen. In the past week, we have been reading about and implementing the variational quantum linear solver algorithm and the variational quantum eigen solver. First, let's talk about the variational methods, which are used by the algorithms. So what is a variational method? First off, variational methods are hybrid algorithms. This means that they are algorithms that combine two different methods, the quantum subroutine and a classical optimizer in our case, to solve some problem. Variational methods are also iterative, meaning that they use the previous results to get closer to the actual value. Lastly, these methods are much more resource efficient. Since variational methods do not use many qubits and quantum computers do not have many qubits, these types of algorithms are the most realistic option for near-term quantum computers. Now we can start talking about the variational quantum eigensolver. Given a Hamiltonian matrix, which is a specific type of matrix, using VQE allows us to find its smallest eigenvalue. There are many applications of VQE. For example, in chemistry, the smallest eigenvalue represents the ground state of a molecule, while in civil engineering, the eigenvalue of smallest magnitude represents the natural frequency of a system modeling a bridge. So after implementing the variation of quantum eigensulfur, we tested it on nine random two by two matrices and recorded the percent error from the actual answer. We did this on an IDEO simulation, which simulates how a perfect quantum computer might operate, and a noisy simulation, which takes into account the fact that current quantum computers will deviate from expected results. The IDEO simulation performed very well, consistently getting within 0.2% error. The noisy simulation in comparison was much worse. However, considering that this is something that can be run on quantum computers we have access to today, a 4% error is still pretty good. Uh, here are the results of our practicality assessment. So the main things to look at is qubits and depth. Qubits is how a quantum computer stores information. It stores it as a superposition of one and zero. It's important to keep track of how many qubits a quantum computer uses because quantum computers don't have access to many qubits. Depth is how many gates are used. Each of the boxes of the letters represents a gate and it changes the qubits value. It's important to keep track of depth because the bigger it is, the more error prone the algorithm is. And in terms of scaling, the main thing to take away is that you could give it a big matrix and you'd still use very few qubits. 
Finally, we can look at the variational quantum linear solver. VQLS uses VQE to solve for linear systems of equations using less qubits than similar algorithms. What VQLS does is that it makes a guess of the parameters that form the quantum state and then calculates the value of the cost function to see how close that initial guess was. One such application of VQLS would be solving partial differential equations. Again, after implementing this algorithm, we tested it on 10 random systems of two equations and two unknowns. This time we recorded the cross product, which is a number between zero and one where a lower number represents uh, that the algorithm got an answer closer to the actual value. For observations, the ideal simulation consistently performed pretty well. There were certain test cases that proved to be difficult for both simulations, but in general, it remains within this zero to 0 0.1 range. The noisy simulation in comparison fluctuated a lot more, going up to 0 0.4 at times. However, again, since this is something that we can run on a quantum computer we have access to today, that is still pretty good. Next, for the practicality assessment, the circuit is, again, pretty small. It uses two qubits and has a depth of six gates, which means that it's not going to use a lot of resources and it's going to run pretty fast. However, it's important to note that while the circuit itself is quite small, this circuit has to be run 1,200 times, and each time 4,096 measurements are taken. So the algorithm itself is relatively slow. And we ran into a few challenges during this project, one of them being the lack of resources on the VQLS. The paper for the VQLS algorithm came out roughly two years ago, and so there was really only one tutorial for it. And if there was something we didn't understand on it, we basically just had to read it over and over again until we did understand it. Uh, so that took a long time to do. On top of that, the algorithm required lots of complicated math formulas, uh, as you can see in these pictures here. Uh, that also took a long time to understand. And with the algorithm being so complicated, we were only able to implement the algorithm with two qubits, and that meant it could only take a two by two matrix. And here are the resources, and thank you for listening. All right, thank you, Russian Bananas. So we did get some questions in this one. So um, what, what was your favorite part of the course, of the program? Well, I think my favorite part of the course was interacting with other uh, kids who had similar interests and talking about uh, some potential problem that we could solve to help uh, improve a Study. Awesome. Awesome. All right, we got another question. What is the advantage of using VQE to solve linear systems compared to HHL? This is a pretty technical question. You guys up to it? Uh, sure. I think uh, the main advantage, and this is the main selling point of uh, VQLS, is that it uses much fewer qubits. Uh, since it's a variational method, each calculation by itself isn't super resource heavy which means that um, even though the algorithm itself does take longer than things like HHL, uh, it's definitely much more realistic on quantum computers that we have access to today or in the near future. Awesome. Oh, and what is uh, Rus Russian bananas? What is that? That's a great question. This is the plot twist. This is the massive plot twist we've been saving for four weeks. The Russian banana is actually a potato. Excellent, excellent. All right, uh, we have one more group, the Quantum Quad. Thank you, guys. Hello, I'm Deptancho Sigdar. Hello, I'm Alvin. Hello, I'm Sabi Raghav. Hi, my name is Justin. We're Quantum Quad, and we have been researching and implementing the NEQR and quantum steganography algorithms during these past two weeks, and we'd love to share what we learned in our experiences. Our initial goal with this project was to be able to do steganography. Now, steganography is concerned with the hiding of information inside other information. For example, here, we hide a message inside the image of the Mona Lisa by slightly changing the pixel values. But to be able to do that, 
we need to be able to do digital image processing. Now, the thing about doing digital image processing on classical computers is that images are big, so classical computers need time to process them. But this presents an opportunity for quantum computers, which can do tasks like these much more efficiently. As you can see here, classical computers use classical bits. To get multiple results, you have to do multiple calculations because classical bits can only be zero or one. But quantum bits, on the other hand, can be in multiple states at once. So with one calculation, you can get many results. Therefore, effectively performing multiple calculations at once. This makes a lot of tasks a lot more efficient on quantum computers, one of those tasks being image processing. The topic we wanted to focus on was steganography, so we decided to break the problem down. Since image processing plays a huge role in steganography, we decided to first look at NEQR, or Novel Enhanced Quantum Representation of Digital Images. NEQR provides an efficient way to process digital images using qubits, which is much faster than the classical processing algorithms we have today. NEQR is the first algorithm to use the basis states of a qubit, that is, being either purely 0 or 1, to store an image's pixel values. This makes the algorithm 100% accurate. The goal is to process a classical digital image, and the input is a 2D array of classical bits, where the bits represent the intensity or the color of the pixel. The output is a quantum image. The algorithm has two registers, or groups of qubits, a position register and an intensity register. For example, let's say we're trying to process this 2x2 two two image here you see on the right. We'll start with the bottom left pixel. Looking at the diagram, we know that the position of that pixel is 0, 1, so the index register or position register will be in that state. We know that the number 200 represents the color or intensity of that shade of gray, so the intensity register will represent 200 in binary. The two registers are, are connected in the sense that anytime we look for the 0, 1 location, we will always get the correct pixel intensity of 200. This is a principle called entanglement. This process is repeated for every pixel until the entire image is processed. In our approach, we first implemented the NEQR algorithm in Qiskit. Then we generalized our program to an n by n grayscale image. Next, we assessed the practicality of NEQR and we finally explored its application in quantum steganography. Now let's see the practicality assessment. For an n by n size image with pixel values ranging from zero to p minus one, the total number of qubits used would follow this expression. The ceiling of the logarithm of p to the base two number of qubits for pixel intensity and two times the ceiling of the logarithm of n to the base two for pixel position. As you can see in the table, for a 2x2 two two image, the depth of the circuit, which is the total number of quantum gates in the critical path, is 22. The compile time of the circuit takes about 1.8 milliseconds, and the accuracy of the circuit run on IBM's AIR simulator reached up to 99%. We also tested our circuit on the fake Montreal quantum computer, which simulates 27 qubits with a typical error rate. The red circled spikes are the correctly encoded pixel values, and the rest of them are noise. Overall, 10 qubits is the minimum for any QR, and it can run on a quantum computer. I'll talk a bit about the applications of any QR. The any QR circuit can function as a general quantum key value mapping. We have applied any QR to quantum image processing, more specifically, steganography where data is secretly embedded within an image. Classically, this information embedding process involves tinkering with the RGB pixel values of the secret image and the cover image in order to combine the two and create a key. Using any QR along with some other auxiliary functions enables an exponential reduction in both image size and the calculations made. There is much to learn from our experience implementing any QR and steganography procedures. Firstly, while the quantum algorithm gives an advantage in processing the image, preparing the NEQR representation is still NP-hard. Secondly, the whole image embedding procedure used upwards of 90 qubits, which is more than the most advanced quantum computer today. However, given that the hardware improves in the future, quantum algorithms like this have enormous upside. To conclude, we would like to thank all the people that made this possible. Thank you to our instructors, as well as our teaching assistant for teaching us the basics of quantum software. Thank you to Mr. Bob Shin, Mr. Joel Grimm, and Ms. Lisa Kelly for providing us with this opportunity. All right, any questions for Quantum Quad?
So one thing that I think your presentation focused on is you the gap between how an algorithm is described in the literature. You mentioned, oh, we can represent this this image data in quantum representation, and it's 100% accurate. But then when you go to actually apply it to a real quantum computer, now you have all these errors. So what would you say is kind of the, the limitations, the current limitations um, to applying this to a, a real, you know, in a real scenario? Um, and what kind of needs to happen before these types of algorithms can be applied to real, pro real problems? Okay, so um, I can take this one. So um, I think one of the most important things that needs to happen is like handling errors when it comes to qubits, because especially with like real quantum computers, there's like a lot of noise and that kind of, um, sorry about that, that kind of uh, messes with the algorithm. So uh, that's what kind of makes the algorithm less accurate. So once you, once we're able to um, calculate, use qubits properly without noise, then that's definitely gonna increase the accuracy of um, the um, algorithm. And also we need to be able to have quantum computers that can handle more qubits because obviously there's not much you can do with like a two by two image, like that's not going to do anything. So um, once we are able to get quantum computers that are, a that are able to like use much more qubits, then that's when we we'll really experience like the power of these algorithms. Awesome, awesome. Another question just came in. How did you deal with reading these hard papers? You showed some, you know, a lot of the groups have showed some like really confusing math on the screen, um, which uh, for the audience, just so the audience knows, the students did not have experience reading this and we didn't even really focus on the math too much in the class. Um, so, so yeah, how did you deal with trying to read a academic paper and then use that to go to a software implementation? I can answer that question. I mean, one of the things that we did was we, when we read the paper, the paper uh, had some circuit diagrams. So we walked through the circuit diagrams, especially by taking a, like a simple two by two pixel image and walked through the circuit, both for, uh, both for any QR as well as stenography. Um, and so that's how we sort of got the idea of the algorithms. And then for in terms of implementing, we did use uh, the Kiske textbook a little bit uh, in terms of Q, any QR uh, because, and that really helped us uh, to implement the algorithms. Awesome, awesome. So yeah, any, any other questions for the students, for, um, you know, for me <laughs> uh, about the course? Uh, one thing that, um, you know, one of the questions that was asked was what was the favorite moment in the course? What was one of the highlights? Um, to me, one of the highlights was we did have a few guest lecturers come in and talk to the students. Um, one we had was Bob Kirker, who's currently the uh, chief scientist at Cambridge Quantum Computing. And that was really exciting uh, to have him come in and speak with the students um, and talk with basically a new uh, form of, of graphical calculus that he's invented. Um, so uh, that's a really new new thing in this field. And so it was cool that the students were some of the first uh, people in the world to be uh, to be learning about that. One highlight of that was um, during the during the seminar, uh, the the CEO of the company called him and he said, "No, I can't talk right now. I'm I'm in a seminar." So told all the students that you know they're more important than the CEO of, of Cambridge Quantum. Um, so, uh, but yeah, any other questions? Any other um, things for any of the students want to add? Um, and I assume you you all are watching some of the questions come in. Um, so if you had any any thoughts you wanted to add, we have a little we have like nine minutes left. Um, so. Let's see, another question came in. Um, when coding traditionally, typically do this at a really high level, how lo low level close to the hardware is quantum software? Does any, any of the students want to take that one? Any brave souls? Can, can I take it? I can... Sure, yeah, go ahead, dip down, shoot. Yeah. Um, so you can think like quantum computing is in the very infancy, in its very infancy. So we're actually programming at the gate level. So like in terms of classical computing, maybe 20 years ago, people were still doing gate level computing, like they put the gates together and that would have an input, transform the input into an output. And so we're doing that sort of thing. So all the algorithms 
uh, they depend on quantum circuits and each quantum circuit has individual quantum gates that have a certain function and we pass an input register and we get an output register and we can utilize quantum mechanical concepts uh, to uh, do manipulations on those qubits. Yeah. yeah, for the, you know, technically savvy in the audience, um, the level that we're, that the students are programming at is really like a hardware description language. Um, so it's very similar to if you are, you know, designing a circuit, but in software, but, it, but it's, you know, it's like a, physical circuit that has the signal comes in and goes through the gates. With quantum, it's slightly different, of course, than in classical computing. Um, it's, it, the gates don't work in exactly the same way, um, but there, there is that analogy there. Um, so yeah. any, any other students want to add anything to that? Yeah, one, one other question that I thought was interesting was, um, how do you know that your code works? How do you know that um, you, know, you, you have these, these complex algorithms and you're saying that, well, today's quantum computers are very limited. Um, and I think Ivan gave a, an answer to that, but one thing that we made sure to emphasize is they all were writing unit tests and using you know, best software development practices, uh, or practices, sorry, while, while doing the quantum software. So, um, just to reemphasize that it was quantum computing, but is also software development. So the students learned a bit of both of those, um, those concepts. Okay. So any other questions from the audience, anything, any of the students want to add any highlights that anybody wanted to share? I did have a, a question I saw that I wanted to add to. Um, now, so earlier someone asked um, if how hard it is to find documentation for these programming languages with um, uh, like Quiskit and, and Q Sharp, these kind of newer programming languages. And I, I wanted to kind of add to that with my own experiences. So we were making our program in Q Sharp, which is a kind of almost a higher le level programming language um, for quantum computing. And one thing we noticed when we were working through everything is we were trying to represent binary with a string, like a, a string of characters. And we were having trouble with that. And trying to find the documentation, going through the API reference um, and going through like Stack Overflow and all of these kind of things, there wasn't much information about how strings worked. And eventually we found out they just kind of didn't. Like strings are very limited in, in um, uh, in Q sharp and that was a very difficult process because of how new this all is and how these these languages have a lot of support from from the developers of them but the, the not enough people use them really for them to have a massive base of like troubleshooting advice and and stack overflow posts like there are some there are there's a community of very dedicated people but there it's still quite a new um, a new field and that's something you have to keep in mind. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And for those of the audience that, that aren't familiar, um, you know, Stack Overflow is a website where people can ask questions and, and you know, industry people that know the answers can just answer. It's an open forum. Um, and so for if you're coding in, for example, a language like Python, that everybody uses Python, um, pretty much anything that you can think of that you want to be able to do in Python, you could just Google it. And you know, there's a Stack Overflow answer will tell you exactly how to do it, um, which is which is awesome. And uh, we definitely encourage students to use that when it's available. But of course, for something like Q Sharp, uh, which is Microsoft's programming language for quantum computing, which the students all learned, um, there's not a lot of uh, answers on Stack Overflow. So you can't really just Google it and find the answer. You have to dig through the documentation yourself. So um, I think this was a, a good experience for the students to to have to really dig to find the answers to the questions. Okay, we got another question in the NISC era. So that's uh, noisy, um, uh, noisy, noisy era where I have noisy qubits. Quantum computing is still limited by decoherence and error. How can we reduce that going forward to utilize its fullest potential? Does anybody have any thoughts about that, particularly some of the um, the groups that did like a hybrid algorithm that was using uh, using quantum for you know a small step in the process. Uh, 
I can talk a little bit about how at least the algorithms that we implemented deal with it. Um, so it's about the uh, more about the classical optimizer and how that deals with the noise that is present in the quantum measurement. Uh, for example, there's a particular optimizer. Um, it's called SPSA. I won't like explain it too much. Uh, but the gist of it is that it um, it both like reduces the number of measurements, which is important because with a quantum computer, you want to um, be able to use it as efficiently as possible. But it also um, has mechanisms to be able to deal with that noise and still get very close to the right answer. Answer. So while it's obviously like not getting to the it to its optimal performance, it's still handling with um, handling it pretty well. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Noisy intermediate scale quantum. It's based on the uh, acronym there. So. Yeah, I just want to add to that real quick. So one of our guest lecturers, they talked about their work with quantum hardware. And in particular, I think that a lot of the optimizations that need to be done in order to reduce error is in the hardware field itself. But um, from the software perspective, I think, you know, using less qubits, um, you less things like, uh, you know, C not gates, which re uh, increase a lot of error. Uh, in quantum hardware and just optimizing things going forward would really reduce some of that error.